Hello and welcome from Bourne. Yeah, that's right. We're not in Lagos today. We're in Bourne, which happens to be the headquarters, or used to be the headquarters, of Germany. But now is the headquarters of the Global Media Forum, the headquarters of Deutsche Welle, sitting beside the offices of the United Nations and DHL, the, one of the indeed the largest courier and packaging company worldwide. But more on that later. For now, let's see the things we have lined up on the show. We will report, as expected, on the Global Media Forum. We will also meet our eco-heroes. We will look at how an app is helping to save the butterfly population in Austria and explore the value of nature and how best we can use it. But now, let's go back and do a report or see how our eco-heroes are having fun at the Global Media Forum. The last steps of a long journey. Billy Kiss Abiola is an environmental activist from Lagos, Nigeria, and is now visiting the Global Media Forum in the German city of Bonn. During the conference, participants from all over the world discuss issues relating to media, politics and development. Billy Kiss has found that both networking and media coverage are crucial for her recycling business. Getting people to support us was much easier because media was able to shine a light on us and let people see what we're doing. And then because of that, we got a lot of people coming to us to support us and help us to grow. Billy Kiss Abiola founded her company, We Cyclers, in 2012. So we're collecting the waste, we sort it. Her employees use bikes to collect garbage that can be recycled from households in Lagos. The recyclables are then separated and sold to companies. It means that a lot of the waste that would usually be burned is reused. And at the same time, Bilikis Abiola earns money. In Bonn, she explores the market with another eco-activist. The town hall, okay. the office. But she just can't leave the topic of waste behind her. I think it's like 50 or even 10 grams. How much money would she get for recycling it? Less than a cent. Less than a cent, but you basically need to have a lot. So when you gather a lot, then you can get something valuable from it. You know, tiny drops make an ocean. Many Germans have up to five different garbage cans at home to separate waste and recycle as much as possible. Billy Kiss is impressed. People are aware of waste around them. Everybody knows about waste. They know that they, they, they cannot dump waste. Um, so I think we want to copy some of that in Nigeria and just have, you know, more awareness, more accessibility, make it easy for people. It's a successful trip for Billy Kiss Abiola. She met inspiring people and got some new ideas. From waste recycling in Nigeria to trash reduction or production in Germany. Now, Germany happens to be one of the largest waste generators in Europe. And that's according to an EU report in 2014 that said that the average German household generates about 600 kilos of waste annually. But guess what? The plastics generated from waste oftentimes end up in the waterways clogging up the system. That's just one example. But we went to Bon Orange and we're being joined by Antje Fudish. Who works there? It's a waste management company. Thank you for joining Hello. us. And please tell me, how do I separate this waste so that it can go back to recycling? Yeah. No for problem. Instance, paper. If you take paper, you put it into the blue bin. OK, here goes. There you go. So. Then we have all the plastic things that goes into the yellow bin. And for the bio waste, bio waste we use the green, green bin. bin. And then you have the material you can't recycle. For this, we use the black bin. Black bin. Yes, and that's, that's it. very easy. Okay. The idea is to see waste as a resource. Plastic bags become plastic films. 
Newspaper is made into shoe boxes and tin cans are turned into new aluminium vessels. It means that this is a growing billion year business and you too can get into it. A big city like Berlin produces a lot of garbage. Each one of these trucks is fully loaded four times a day. Most residents of the country are actually pretty conscientious about separating their trash. The yellow bins are for packaging, at least in theory. The most absurd thing was a living room wall unit that had been broken up and carefully piled into the bin. That was the weirdest thing I've seen. In Germany, trash disposal companies receive a fee from manufacturers and the retail industry for recycling packaging. The whole process is managed by a complex system of rules. But in addition to packaging, the collectors will take any objects made of metal or plastic, which can be resold. The garbage truck brings its load to a huge sorting depot. Every year, around 120,000 tons of waste end up here. 70% of it can be recycled. The machinery can isolate 15 different types of material. There's a global demand for metals, plastic, and paper. There's been a lot of innovation in Germany over the past two decades. And we now have a lot of opportunities to sell our technology around the world. Germany is well placed to take advantage of future growth in collecting and sorting. But recycling doesn't stop here. The company also earns money through processing. Plastic, for example, is cleaned and made into a granulate. It sells for around 500 euros a ton. Roses in full bloom, a sign that insect life is thriving. But it's not like that everywhere. Climate change and overuse of pesticides are threatening creatures great and small, and butterflies are among them. An initiative in Austria is working to ensure that these unique creatures are not lost to our world. protect butterflies with our smartphones? Butterflies aren't just pretty creatures, they're also essential to the ecosystem. Just like bees, they pollinate a wide range of plants. But in Europe, half of all butterfly species have disappeared over the last 25 years. That's mainly due to urbanization and the use of pesticides. Now the app Butterflies Austria is helping to protect them. People can upload pictures and learn to identify different species. In doing so, users contribute to a data bank of butterflies in Austria. And knowing these insects makes it easier to protect them. We like that. If you are also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet at hashtag doing your bit. We'll share your stories. The waves continue to pound against Nigeria's coastline and the activities of man are making it a bit more difficult and efforts need to be put in place to protect the coastline. Well, one initiative called the Kids Beach Garden is working with children. Now, the organizers feel that if they teach the younger population or the younger generation how to protect the coastline, it will help in building a more sustainable world. Let's see what they're doing. Rising sea levels and tidal currents eroding the Lagos Nigerian coastline. The team at the Kids Beach Garden, an initiative for children, has devised a plan to protect the beach and the environment at large. They intend to plant 500 coconut trees along the stretch of sand, making up the garden. Doyinsula Ogunye, the brain behind this project, has devised a means of involving children in the process of giving new life to the environment. 
the reason why we're in including children in everything we do because we don't want to leave a generational gap. We want it to continue from one generation to the other. The organization invites children and young people from the neighborhood on a regular basis to plant coconut trees. Plants that offer variety. Every part of the coconut tree is useful, from the fruit, to the oil, to the leaves, to the um, stem, to the raffia. What, they use it for everything. The coconut trees will take a few years to get bigger, but the team thinks it's worth it. Yes, yeah, so let's go plant these ones and watch them grow. It's the best time of year for this type of environmental action. The right time to plant, I always say, was 20 years ago. The second best time to plant is now. And the good thing is we're now in the raining season, so this is the best time to put a seed in the ground. Some trees have already been planted, and hopefully they will soon help to avoid the erosion, one small sapling at a time. Every day, we go about our activities in various ways. Some of the things we do, or many times the things we do, destroy nature. How many of us really pay attention to the value of nature? How many of us know that by destroying nature, we actually waste money? In other words, when we protect nature, when we nurture nature, we save money. But do we know that? A global initiative called the Economy of Ecosystems and Biodiversity is wanting to help human beings understand that by protecting one tree, you save quite a lot of money. Environmental scientists are taking inventory in Leipzig's urban forest. They're trying to discover which plants, trees and shrubs grow here. They investigate how the vegetation is doing and how frequently different varieties are to be found. Leipzig boasts the largest hardwood alluvial forest of any German city. Around 20 different tree species grow here, just a few kilometers from the city center. The floodplain forest floor is a lush green. The nutrient-rich soil helps vegetation grow quickly and neutralize more CO2 than any other types of forest. In summer, the forest keeps the city cool. It also cleans the air of dust and car emissions but it can do more. When the big rivers burst their banks, the water can spread out into the floodplain forest. It serves as flood protection. At the same time, it filters nutrients and contaminants out of the water. In nature, the alluvial forest is the equivalent of a human kidney. Still, just 1% of these forests remain intact. Even in Leipzig's alluvial forest, marshy areas have become rare. The rivers have been channeled, leaving the ground too parched to draw many nutrients out of the water. That's why the researchers want to re-naturalize the forest. They've looked at studies on ecosystems around the world. Mangrove forests are a central theme. They provide flood protection, breeding grounds for fish and regulate soil salinity. They're among the most valuable and most endangered ecosystems on Earth. So a project in Liberia educates people in coastal areas on the functions performed by mangroves. And it's developing strategies to prevent their destruction caused by agriculture, mining and urbanization. The ecological problem with the mangroves goes back 30, 40, maybe 50 years. And now we must see how we can deal with the consequences. First, we have to stop destruction from occurring. And where possible, try to restore parts. The environmental economists want to make people aware of the services nature provides, which go largely unnoticed. Take the way alluvial forests purify water. That saves German towns and cities over 500 million euros annually, year after year. To quantify such a figure, the scientists must answer a host of questions. What does this ecosystem do for people? What does it regulate and how? 
Es geht darum, die Gesellschaft It's about convincing society that nature is important. We should try to do that with economic arguments, by determining and analyzing nature's services, sometimes even monetizing them, and incorporating this info into societal decisions. In Germany, their work has already made a difference. There's a growing realization of the value of alluvial forests, and in many places, drained floodplains are now being renaturalized. Healthy living and food is becoming increasingly popular, and there is plenty of that on offer here at the Bourne Market. Awareness of environmentally friendly behavior is also on the increase, and that includes what we drive, e-mobility, or e-vehicles. Well, Germany had that plan to have about a million electric cars on the roads by 2020. But as that time approaches, the Minister of Transport is beginning to wonder if that target can be met simply because there are not too many charging points and the people are weary of electric cars. But is it possible to meet that target or would it be jettisoned? Our next piece is posing the same questions. At this Berlin car dealership, the salesman is using every trick in the book to win over his customer. How roomy it is and easy to get into, the natural materials it's made of. It's an electric car, a BMW i3, the car maker's first electric powered model in mass production. I think I'm a typical electric car driver. I drive 11 kilometers in one direction in the morning and 11 kilometers back in the evening. Luckily, I can recharge it at home. I'm certainly thinking seriously about it. But when it comes to actually buying, the customer balks. What if the battery runs out and leaves her stranded? That's the way lots of drivers think in Germany. Uwe Schäfer knows why. The automotive engineer goes for a test drive in a VW Golf, electric of course, on the market for about two years now. It costs about 35,000 euros, much more than a normal Golf. That's another hurdle for the would-be buyers. And yet another is the recharging problem, needed every 190 kilometers, and it takes time. I don't think we can expect much improvement in charging times for the next five to ten years. We'll have to get used to about half an hour for fast charging and for a normal charge, six hours and up. And across the country there aren't enough charging stations. Big cities like Berlin are trying to change that and are trying out new ideas, like recharging from streetlights. In Berlin alone, some 5,000 streetlights could become charging stations. Electric cars do have one huge advantage over diesel and gasoline vehicles, zero emissions. E-cars, very good for the environment. But let's come back here. Just beside the Deutsche Welle buildings is the headquarters of DHL, whose CEO is one of the few Africans in management positions in Germany. But because DHL is doing quite a bit for the environment, we want to find out a bit more of how they're doing it and why they're even doing it. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to meet the boss. Let's go. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Diallo, for speaking with us and for meeting us. Thank you. You're the head of a, one of the largest logistics companies around the world. Mm. And for almost 10 years, you guys have been working on that motto, going green, or go green. What yeah. exactly does that entail? Now, go green is all around sustainability. So, you know, because we are citizens of this world, uh, we feel equally responsible as governments or non-government organizations in terms of contributing to make a world a better place. In 2008, we committed to reduce and improve our carbon efficiency uh, by 30% by the year 2020. This is not something that has been given to us by governments or international organizations. That's a commitment that was developed by our own organization where we said we will do our best to have reduced carbon emission uh, in the way of processing goods or delivering services to our customers. But let's look at what you do here in Bonn. Yeah. You, you use um, e-vehicles in Bonn. 
we're using more and more e-vehicles in the urban areas because you know we have a lot of concentration of population in the urban cities and therefore in order for us to be able to operate within those environments without contributing to having higher pollution uh, we started producing electric vehicles which we are actually manufacturing ourselves can that model be um can it be developed in other parts of the world? When we're talking about corporate social responsibility, I just come back to myself, you know, I come from a small village in Senegal. The purpose of me standing here is also to ask myself every day, what is it that I'm doing so that my kids, their friends, or people that are left in my village will have a world in which they will evolve and then try to change the world to make it a better place. Therefore, everything that we do, we do it not only in Africa, we don't do it only in, in Germany or in other European or American countries, we do it in all the countries so, that, so as to affect a positivity in the environments in which we are operating. Tell me how I can go green. So, in my activity, yeah. in my work, yeah. in my family, in my school, what do I do? Good. I mean, you know, every day when you wake up in the morning, you go and have a shower maybe you can measure how long you're going to have a shower. Secondly, when you're getting out of your home, you might have some electric devices that you're using. Ask yourself which of them you should plug or unplug. Thirdly, when you get out of your home, you might be using a car that pollutes a lot, or you might be using a bus or a train. Choose the best responsible way of getting out of your place to go wherever you're going. And then when you achieve a place and you find a lot of people sitting around you, try to convince them to do the same thing as you, and then if you all do it, then we all jointly will be contributing in making the place, uh, the, the world a safer place. Thank you very much, Mr. You're most welcome. Okay, so we round up today's show with a return to the organizer of the Global Media Forum, Deutsche Welle, with about 3,000 employees who inform, analyze, and make sense of what's going on around the world, especially with politics, governance, science, environment in Germany, Africa, and around the world, the state of our earth also. In particular, we return to the African continent, particularly the Republic of Congo, where the construction of logging roads and logging is depriving the gorillas of their natural habitat. Plus, the commercial hunt for bushmeat and all of that is also affecting the environment. So, a tropical ecologist is working with those logging companies to see how best they can do their business while managing the natural resources and vegetal cover of the Republic of Congo. Gorillas are the largest primates on our planet. Their only enemy is man, and we have almost driven them into extinction. Logging poses a severe threat to the gorilla's habitat. But in Toholko, a timber company in the Republic of Congo, is looking for sustainable alternatives. They employed Antoine Couturier, a tropical ecologist. To ensure sustainable logging, his team collects data about animals and plants before trees are felled. They also make sure one quarter of land under concession is untouched. Here, for example, there's a very high density of gorillas in a zone that we've had protected as a reserve. When they log, they only fell one tree a year in an area as large as two soccer fields. As the trees are carefully selected and grow in healthy surroundings, their wood is of a better quality, which means the company gets a better price. And the gorillas don't mind if it's only one tree at a time. By our observations, we know that not only gorillas, but buffalo and elephants move in soon after trees are cut. A recent survey suggests the gorilla population in the area has doubled over the last seven years. Now there are 70,000 animals. And at the same time, Interholco is making a profit. So the sustainable business model is a win-win strategy. 
And that's our show for today from Bourne at the Global Media Forum. It's been an exciting time. But for more on our coverage and more on the Global Media Forum, just go to our website. It's showing on your screen. Check out our media, social media platforms as well to get more information. And you can also get in touch through the social media platforms and our emails. They're showing on your screen as well. Till we bring you another edition of the show, this time not from Bourne, back in Nigeria. See you again.